Among his several published works are issues dealing with universal access and building critical mass. He once served as vice president of the Digital Bridge Institute in Nigeria, where his charge including developing labor for the growing telecommunications industry in the country. The lecture topic that he's chosen today, I think, fits in quite well also with the lectures that we've had earlier this morning. Winning against terrorism, question mark. U.S. interests, Nigeria, and the Boko Haram. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Professor Chuka Omochili. Thank you. How's everyone doing? <laughs> okay, the topic today, of course, is about Boko Haram in Nigeria. Uh, but it's very important to make two key points uh, before I start off. That is that when we talk about soft or hard power, there are two key things that we have to bear in mind. One of them is, are we looking for sustainable peace or are we looking for short-term peace? This is absolutely important. If we are looking for sustainable peace, then we have to look for a way that the parties that are involved in any crisis or conflict buy into a solution to that crisis or conflict. That's one key thing. And when we talk about the presence of culture, one of the things that I would like to point out is when we think about what culture is, culture deals with essentially three key elements that are very important, which is the belief of those people. It really doesn't matter what our own beliefs are, because people may have a different belief from us. There is also the question of values and then the norms of those people. All of these three elements are usually embodied, em, em, embedded in the interests that a party holds during a conflict and must be addressed for sustainable peace. And essentially, what I'm going to talk about today is to show how soft power would help us get to that, particularly in reference to the issue uh, of crisis in Nigeria today. So by saying this, I would point out that while there has been quite a lot of talk about the Middle East, about terrorism, and about the rise of Chinese influence, very few people are paying attention to some of the emerging issues in unlikely geopolitical arenas, to in a emerge, unlikely geopolitical arenas, or to be more specific, issues in regions that are often ignored. Here I am referring to Africa, which has garnered very few headlines in the, big, in the bigger picture of USA diplomacy in recent times. In this region that I address today, specifically my interest is Nigeria, which is the region's number two market and is located strategically on the continent's west coast. As you are perhaps aware, Nigeria is an interesting country with always the probability of crisis. But since its civil war of 1967, to 1970. There is no potential for major crises than the one that presently exists, which has been variously labeled a religious crisis. It is the crisis that I address today. It is important that as I address the Nigerian crisis, that we understand this from the perspective of the United States foreign policy and the, po and the possibilities for the use of soft power. After all, that is a central issue addressed by this particular conference. It is important to note that even though I give the impression that this discourse is primarily shaped by the theme of this conference, the reality is that the issues that I will discuss here transcend the theme of this conference, and thus, I hope that the issues and suggestions that I make here are seen or observed as independent of the conference itself. I begin by talking about the background to that conference, I mean to that conflict, the Nigerian conflict. Many intellectuals cite 2002 as the year for the founding of JAMA II 
Ali Suna Lada White Wal Jihad, otherwise known as Boko Haram. The name of the organization refers to the group committed to the, spread, to the spreading of the prophet's teaching. Boko Haram, a name widely given to the group by non-members, means Western civilization is forbidden in Hausa and is rejected by the organization. However, we will use Boko Haram throughout this presentation since it is the name for which the group is widely known. Though I have established, I have cited the establishment of Boko Haram as 2002, it is instructive to note that the goals of Boko Haram are no different from those of groups that existed before Boko Haram. The goal is the same, that is, the establishment of a theocracy in a country that will be governed according to the teaching of Islam and they promise to emancipate the Nigerian masses from the oppressive governance of the Western elite. These groups have been several and most continued the goal of the late Sadwana of Sokoto, Sa Amadu Bello, who received initially $60,000 from the Saudi government in 1964, after a speech which he made in the world, at the World Islamic Congress, where he stated the following. I have, by the grace of Allah, been able to convert some 60,000 non-Muslims in my region to Islam within a period of five months. Throughout the region, there was over a million Quranic schools scattered about every corner of towns and villages. I would like to say that this is only the beginning, as there are other areas we have not yet tapped. I hope that we will claim Nigeria and we would go further afield in Africa. This was part of Sadwana Sokoto speech back in 1964. The late Sadwana, to be very clear, did not use violent means which are the means applied today. But it certainly was the baseline where expression of converting a mostly Christian South was expressed. The years that followed have not only included religious clashes between Muslim and Christians in the north of the country, but clashes between fundamentalist Muslim groups in the north and Nigerian authorities. The most remembered of these clashes followed the Mai Tatsine uprising from December 1980 to 1982. The Mai Tatsine uprising followed several years of smuggling of audio tapes on fundamentalist teaching into the country from the north, particularly from Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Also note that the founder of Boko Haram, Mohammed Yusuf, studied Islamic theology in Medina, Saudi Arabia, where he became an adherent to the obscurantist Wahhabi sect. And the increasing power of ulamas among Muslim youths in the north. The Mai Tatsine riots began in Kano in 1980, and then in Kaduna and Mai Dugri in 1982. In the end, as many as 4,200 people died, and there was also extreme property damage. This turn of events and increased conversion of youths to fundamentalism reflect adverse economic conditions for these youths and their belief that a theocracy is a solution. It is estimated that two thirds of residents of Boronu State the heart of Boko Haram, live in abject poverty. The blame points squarely on the voracious wealth, wealthy elite whose mansions and opulence is in stark difference to the immense poverty that surround them. Olamas, or to be more specific, extremist Islamic scholars, 
have taken advantage of this class cleavage to recruit youths with promises of a better tomorrow under Quranic rule. But it is not just the ulamas that have done this. The governors of Nigerian northern states have also taken advantage, declaring their states as Sharia states in order to attract mass support from the youth and the impoverished. To be clear, this political move by the northern governors have not made them amiable to the ulamas or fundamentalists because the later groups see the declaration of Sharia states as perfunctory, not going far enough, and merely as a populist move to delay mass action against the governors who are part of the elite class. Boko Haram has, of course, achieved notoriety for the use of extreme violence again, that include indiscriminate bombing of churches, government agency buildings, media houses, international agencies, and mass gatherings, selected shooting of elites, and threats against the public. Since 2002, thousands of Nigerians have been killed in violence associated with this group. The figure has been put at between 1,000 to 3,000 persons, depending on the source. With the background to the Boko Haram crisis, it is important to ask, why should the United States of America be concerned? What could be an appropriate response to this threat, if any? There are several reasons why the United States should be concerned, and I list each of them as follows. One, Nigeria remains the sixth largest crude oil supplier to the United States. Moreover, the importance of Nigeria's oil looms large with constant uncertainty in the oil producing countries in the Middle East. Two, Al Qaeda has constantly sought locations for its operations against US interests. It is important to note that Boko Haram in 2009 clearly stated the following. Boko Haram is just a version of Al Qaeda, which we align with and respect. We support Osama bin Laden. We shall carry out his command in Nigeria until the country is totally Islamicized, which is according to the wish of Allah. This is a direct quote from Boko Haram. Number three. The rise of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, that is, in, in, in short, Akim, that is A-Q-I-M, in countries like Algeria, Mauritania, Niger Republic, and Northern Mali, with its known interaction with Boko Haram in Nigeria, poses an increasing threat to U.S. interest in the northern and western regions of Africa. Moreover, Boko Haram has been associated with the Somalian group Al-Shabaab. Four, U.S. interests to be in the prime position to assist emerging economies to maintain democracy and free markets. That's the U.S. interest. Not only is this threatened by Boko Haram, but this prime position is increasingly threatened by China's growing economic presence, which is a prelude to significant political presence. As you are aware, Nigeria is the most populated African country and the second largest African economy. Importantly, they have remained a close American ally, but with increasing Chinese incursion and diplomatic interests. Several of these key interests have been acknowledged by the U.S. Ambassador to the United States, I mean to Nigeria, Mr. Terence McCauley. Importantly, if indeed Nigeria is critical to U.S. foreign policy and presence in the Africa region. It is self-evident that the U.S. addresses the Boko Haram issue with the importance that it deserves. This is not to say that the United States has stood by while Boko Haram crisis continues in Nigeria. To the contrary, the United States has been active, particularly in the intelligence area. However, 
the United States needs to up the ante in the area of seeking long-term sustainable solutions. As we can see, any United States attempt in this area has not been successful, as demonstrated in the current Nigerian government response to this situation, which has been largely to use military force to stem the crisis. Military force may lead to victory over the sect if one is focused on dislocating the sect from its current physical locations. But that will only send the sect's members on the ground and harden their stance towards violence that the sect currently pursues. Let us for one moment review the Nigerian government response to the activities of Boko Haram. The Nigerian government has focused its efforts in military action against the sect, believing that the successes of such actions against previous groups like Maitat Sine potent success against Boko Haram. But this fails to take into account that dislodging Maitat Sine in the 1980s from its physical location did not end the goal of the Maitat Sine group, which is evident by the rise of subsequent groups such as Boko Haram. Neither has the government taken into account the failure of similar military action in the Niger Delta. In the Niger Delta, the youth and militant groups responded to harsh military action by revenge, I mean, with revenge killings, widespread kidnapping of oil refinery workers, and damage of oil facilities. The relative peace now existing in Niger Delta came from negotiation and not harsh military actions. But I think at this point, I will try to get to the very end of this. The point that I want to also mention before I go towards the end of this is that even though there has been military action, one also has to acknowledge that Nigerian government has attempted to use other avenues. For instance, there have been uh, negotiations that have taken place in Saudi Arabia and one in Senegal involving this particular group, but none of this has yielded any, any good result. But I want to talk about the way forward. Obviously, US activities in Nigeria point to its concerns about Nigeria's ability to counter terrorism, particularly terror associated with Islamic fundamentalism that target United States as enemy, the United States has already provided counterterrorism advisors to Nigeria and U.S. Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program and the Trans-Sahel Counterterrorism Project that have been supported by Nigerian authorities. However, these have mostly been used to support the Nigerian military response to Boko Haram crisis, which does not portend long-term solutions. To achieve longer-term solution, it is important to turn attention to activities that are best described as soft power activities. These activities are those that pull rather than push the other party towards cooperation. In essence, the other party cooperates without any lingering ill will against, long, against former adversary. Clearly, with soft while soft power has potential for long-term and sustainable solution, it takes time, and one party does not have unilateral control of its processes or outcomes. In essence, it is complex. This complexity and lack of immediate gains should not distract from the ultimate goal of long-lasting peace. The two soft power um, elements or activities that I suggest here is to talk about things like social development and the education, which are some of the things that the youth that are currently being recruited into Boko Haram, these are some of the things that they lack. And because they lack this, they are finding ways to compensate for this. And if there is a promise that a different state, a theocratic state, could exist to offer them solutions to these issues, they would move towards those types of states. And that's the current situation. So the, the, the object ought to be 
to satisfy this very interest that they want, but satisfy it in such a way that they are not pulled towards uh, those recruitments that exist as of now. I would like to end here. Okay. And I, would you comment, if you could, on what the Nigerian government is doing to uh, stop the financing of these organizations? The government controls mm -hmm. the central bank, and the central bank has a financial intelligence unit which reports to uh, the police authorities. I mean, Boko Haram is committing crimes uh, and their criminal activities, and they can be stopped if they don't have the financing, as well mm -hmm. as the efforts to educate and provide jobs for others. The other uh, area where um, the government can take a, a softer response than the military one is to uh, effectively manage its borders. And um, the United Nations has been helping countries implement Resolution 1373 of the Security Council and providing financing, not just from the United States, but from many, many countries, the European Union, Japan, uh, and, and others, the OIC, for example, are providing money to countries that need assistance in this area. Okay. Um, the first one, Nigeria has actually, they've tried, uh, but you know, a lot of these things depend also in intelligence that you gather. Uh, one of the things that they have done is to cut off the financing by identifying through investigation some individuals, even within the country, uh, some of them have been actually politically uh, elected. Uh, one was a senator, uh, a former senator who was identified as helping to finance the organization to try to cut that off. Uh, but I think the big point that I make here is that there needs to be a lot more done in providing that intelligence and that the United States needs to support uh, in this arena because it's it's of vital U.S. interest as well, not just the Nigerian interest. Um, as you point out, there has been funds that have been um, provided, including the U.S. government, not only providing funds, but launching several programs where they provide assistance to the government in trying to deal with Boko Haram. Uh, but as of now, none of those things have been very effective. And my major concern is that the continued, uh, would I say, prioritization of military action is more likely going to harden the group as well as their supporters. Because the truth of the matter is that it's not simply just talking about Boko Haram as a group that we may be able to identify the members, but in the whole of not, they do have sympathizers because these are people that are within the community. If they didn't have sympathizers, they would be easily identified. Uh, but Nigerian government recognizes them as faceless and they, have, they remain faceless simply because they have the support within the community. I would like to know uh, if the OPEC has a specific relation in how the economic agenda in Nigeria is going and how does this affect the against the mm -hmm. Well, the, one of the things is that, uh, fortunately, the, uh, the Boko Haram issue has not much affected Nigeria in terms of the oil issues, uh, primarily because the, where this activity is taking place is mostly in the northern part of the country, whereas the oil is in the Niger Delta sector. So uh, in terms of talking about crisis in Nigeria in general, uh, that is beyond Boko Haram. There was an effect on it, particularly at the height of the Niger Delta crisis, because that was at the heart of the oil producing area. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, yeah, really nice. That's it. Okay.